Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Have you been blessed tonight? Yes, you have. Yes, you have indeed. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that tonight we are in your presence. We are grateful that your Holy Spirit is here. We are thank you, thankful that your heart is towards us and that you long to bless us. Paul wrote telling us that you who were willing to send your son Jesus to die for us are willing, you have demonstrated your willingness to bless us in every way. I ask that tonight you would speak. I pray that we would be encouraged. I pray that we would desire in our inmost beings to serve you and to be yours. Speak, Lord, please. We are listening. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Fifteen years ago, my wife and I were wrestling with trying to decide what we should name our child. We did not know whether it would be a boy child or a girl child. First time around, we took our chances and went with a surprise. It would be a boy or a girl. We couldn't be that surprised. It would be one or the other. <laughs> second time around, kind of funny. The second time around, I could tell I was just killing my wife. Do you think we should find out if it's a boy or a girl? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need to know. Do you think we should find out if it's a boy or a girl? No? Do you think we should find <laughs> Over a period of days and weeks, you know. And of course, my response was, you're carrying the baby. You're the one giving birth. Whatever you want to do, we do. And so we found out the second time around ahead of time that Shannon would be a girl. But we didn't know what the first one was going to be, and so we started picking baby names. Now, what my wife didn't know is that I had already named our daughter. I'd named her about 10 years before I got married. And there really wasn't going to be much my wife could do about that. She floated some girl names past me, but they were terrible. <laughs> it was always going to be Shannon. Shannon was named after the river on the banks of which my grandmother was born. My grandmother was born on the banks of the River Shannon in Ireland. To this day, my daughter is exceedingly grateful that my grandmother was not born on the banks of the Mississippi. <laughs> my son was always going to be named something sensible. Now, you know, you have these modern thinking types who give their children I don't know, titles or handles or I, fancy names. I was never going to call my child Blaze or True or, you know. Now, if you have a Blaze or a True, well, you know, God bless you, but that's not for me. Not going to happen. I was never going to name my child Ezekiel. Nothing wrong with a very, very Hebrew biblical name. That's okay, but no, not for me. For you, fine. For me, no. No, I mean, really. I really don't mind, but not for me. Uh, in my family, five boys. The oldest is Paul. Paul. I mean, if ever there was a vanilla name, it's Paul. 
no disrespect. I mean, it's just a, a very, no, like John, I mean, goodness sake. Paul, Wayne, David, Greg, John. I mean, nothing very exciting there. And so my son would be named something like that. Something like that. Um, when we came, we looked at David and Stephen and Michael and Nicholas. I gave my son Nicholas as a middle name. The problem was there were just too many bratty Nicholases around, and I couldn't, I couldn't name him Nicholas, even though I might have thought that's a lovely name, I think. So we settled on Jacob, and one of the, one of the selling points for me was that when we named our son Jacob, I mean, I had never met a little boy named Jacob. There were no Jacobs around. And that year, Y2K, was the year that Jacob went to number one in the charts. <laughs> we'd take our little boy to the park and we'd call out, Jacob, and nine kids would come running. <laughs> Two of them girls running towards us. <laughs> Jacob. So we named him Jacob. Now, I have to tell you, I did, I did struggle briefly with the idea of naming him Jacob because of what the name Jacob means. It means a supplanter. You know the story of Jacob and Esau, how Jacob diddled Esau out of the birthright with the help of his mother and deceived his father and all of that. Jacob meaning a supplanter, one who gets what he gets by devious means. And I thought, oh boy, really? Do I want to name my son Jacob knowing that that's what the name means? And then I thought, then I thought you know, there's a, we're all Jacob really. Later, Jacob became Israel because he, he, he this, this sinful individual, wrestled with God and had a new experience and was given a new name. And I, it's true for all of us. We as sinners must wrestle with God and gain a new experience and be given a new name, which the Bible says we'll all be given one day. I thought, that's okay. Jacob, in order for him to get from here to there, he must become Israel anyway. So Jacob, and I just love the name and I love my son, and, and that was that. Uh, my wife's name, Melissa, means honeybee, evidently, honeybee. I mean, I could take that in several directions, but I'm just not going to. A honeybee. Very fitting name for my wife. And then my own name, John, I learned as a very young age, at a very young age, my father told me, because that was his name as well, it means God is gracious. God is gracious. I've always liked that. I've always been very glad that my name means God is gracious. And over the years, I've had cause to reflect often upon that, that thing called grace. Grace. It's very important to us as believers. One of the most wonderful verses in the Bible deals with grace, Ephesians 2, verse 8. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm such a, a, a proponent and appreciator of grace. I named my daughter Shannon Grace. Grace is her, her middle name. We believe in grace. We believe in grace. Can you say amen? amen. Grace. Where would we be without, without grace? I find it amusing that some churches feel that they must, in order to identify themselves, what they believe is accurately, include the word grace in the name of the church grace community church i'm not against that that's fine i'm not against that but what has happened that we have had to double over backwards to prove to others and to ourselves that we believe in grace why has that happened uh if you say seventh day adventist in some areas it the, 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 some will say mm, saturday right saturday well, sure. Others will say, yes, vegetarians. Isn't that right? And we'll say, well, sort of. And, and these are things that we're known for. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit unfortunate, but I'm not even sure how, how realistic this really is. But it's a little bit unfortunate that we're not known for being people of grace. That we're not known for being gracious Christians who major in the grace of God. Now, Spaulding, A.W. Spaulding wrote in his four-volume set years ago, I thought this was fascinating. He said that one of the reasons Adventists uh, hammered the law, the law, the law years ago is because they felt when they came to town that people already understood salvation. They didn't have to prove Jesus to anyone. 
They didn't have to prove getting saved to anyone, but there were people who believed in Jesus but didn't believe in keeping the law. And so our uh, 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 forefathers would come into town uh, brandishing their, their six guns and, and they'd argue with the local ministry about the law of God because that's where we differed. And that's okay too because we had a point to prove, I suppose. That's okay. And that was then. Grace. We believe in grace and we appreciate grace and we thank God for grace. But do we understand grace? Now, I, I'm familiar with a definition that you are familiar with as well when it comes to this idea of grace. And many would say that grace is unmerited favor. And you'll read that in many very good theological textbooks. Grace is unmerited favor. And you can't argue that. Grace is, you can't say it's not. Sure it is. I don't know if you would say grace is unmerited favor or if you'd say that unmerited favor is grace. For everything God does for us is unmerited. We cannot earn anything. We cannot curry favor in the eyes of the Almighty. We can't get in His good books by our deeds or our words or our gifts. So everything God shines upon us is unmerited. We did not earn the right to breathe or eat or sleep or enjoy sunsets or tulips. We didn't earn that right. We didn't and we cannot earn the right to eternal life. God gives these things to us. These are unmerited. And then, and then everything that God allows to come our way is favor. Everything. There's a fascinating statement in a wonderful book called The Desire of Ages, which if you haven't read lately, you ought to find and read as a wonderful book. And, and in there, the author says that when we look back on our lives, we will not will that God changed anything about it. Now, that's a stunning thought, isn't it? You're going to look back and say, but what about my wife's Alzheimer's? One day, one day, you'll look back and say, God did the right thing. The accident which disabled you, one day you'll look back and you'll say, God, I'm glad you didn't change it. The child you lost as an infant, I, I'm not saying these things don't matter. They're of enormous consequence. This is, this is something that stretches our, our understanding and challenges our faith. But according to God, we'll look back one day and we will not will that God changed anything. Even the challenges that come our way are manifestations of the favor of God. Perhaps we don't understand that now, but as my son and I read this morning from the book of Isaiah, God says, his ways are not our ways, and our ways aren't his ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. There are some things we may not get right now, but we'll get it one day. Everything God grants us is unmerited, and every manifestation of the workings of God is favor. That's just how it is, because God is always good, and he is never wrong. Can you say amen? Grace, unmerited favor. That's all right. But I don't think it's all right enough. I don't think it's all right enough. I'm going to share with you a definition of grace that I stumbled across. Honestly, if I, if I was not so lazy, I would find where I got this definition from. I don't remember. I don't believe I got it from any inspired writing. I found it somewhere, and I like it very much, but I do not remember where I really should find out. But listen to this, would you? Grace, here's a definition. The merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtues. Now, I don't expect you to be able to synthesize that just like that. But here's essentially what that definition means if I were to uh, concentrate it. Grace is what God does through his mercy to draw us to Christ, to keep us in Christ, and to grow us so that we become increasingly more like Christ. Now, for me, that's a little fuller than just saying unmerited favor. Unmerited favor is fine. That's okay. But this, I think, fattens it up a little bit. Because you and I both know that this idea of grace, God's grace, 
has been misused and abused over the years so that people can feel good about their sinful lives because of God's grace so that people can believe they'll be saved not from their sin but in their sin because after all it says on my birth certificate that God is gracious many I believe misunderstand and misuse grace I'm not accusing you of doing that but you know and you've seen this over the years that people have misunderstood this idea of grace and that can lead people to presumption of the worst kind you know that there are going to be a lot of people down in the close of time uh, uh, who are going to get a terrible surprise Lord Lord these are believers they call him Lord haven't we prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works and then God says to them depart from me ye that work iniquity I what never knew you they call him Lord but he was not their Lord at all he was a crutch perhaps or he was an excuse or a covering of some sort or a cloak but he was not their Lord and it was not grace that worked in their lives a couple of years ago I had the good fortune of uh, filming an it is written television program on the life and ministry of Dietrich Bonhoeffer Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a giant I don't mean to suggest he was a perfect man I don't mean that but he was a terrific pastor and theologian he was a very brave man a very brave man while in the United States he was called back to Germany he felt God was calling him back there to oppose Hitler even though he knew that he was going to go back to an almost certain death the church in Germany was asleep the church in Germany had rolled over and played dead before Hitler's machine of wickedness Bonhoeffer would do no such thing Bonhoeffer in fact if you want a moral ethical situation to wrestle with Bonhoeffer was executed because he had participated in a plot to execute Hitler I'm not going to tell you he was right or wrong for doing that you can figure that out but Bonhoeffer was a great man while he was in New York City he sat at the feet of the Reverend Dr. Adam Clayton Powell the senior pastor of the Abyssinian uh, Baptist Church Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem in New York City and Dr. Powell Dr. Powell used a term that struck a chord with Bonhoeffer Dr. Powell would preach about cheap grace and this was a, a, a term a concept that Bonhoeffer in his work and his writings developed and uh, Bonhoeffer wrote particularly in his book the cost of discipleship about about cheap grace and it was it was inspiring you know to go to the city of Wroclaw in Poland it used to be Breslau in Germany but you know how those borders shifted and names changed and we went to Berlin and we went to Flossenburg the concentration camp where Bonhoeffer died and we filmed there and it was f freezing cold but we filmed there as the snow fell and 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 these are some of the concepts that Bonhoeffer wrote about here's what he wrote about grace he said cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance baptism without church discipline church discipline you remember that communion without confession cheap grace is grace without discipleship grace without the cross grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate now then he said something about costly grace and if anybody understood the cost of discipleship it was Bonhoeffer he followed Jesus into a war zone he followed Jesus into very definitely and I hope you understand what I mean when I say the land of the enemy he followed Jesus very literally to his death he understood something about the cost of discipleship and he wrote this about costly grace he said costly grace confronts us as a gracious call to follow Jesus 
It comes as a word of forgiveness to the broken spirit and the contrite heart. It is costly because it compels a man to submit to the yoke of Christ and follow him. It is grace because Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there is grace and we, we accept it and we thank God for it. But I think it's very important that we, that we, that we define it correctly. Are we forgiven by grace? Yes or no? Yes, we are. That was not a trick question. But if you read the early verses of Romans and chapter 1, you discover that God gave us grace for obedience. You see, grace isn't just a cloak to cover your sin so you can go on living that old way, feeling good about yourself, feeling that God will turn a blind eye to willful transgression because, after all, there's grace. Grace, in addition to forgiveness, is power. Grace is enabling grace. It is grace that cleans you up, yes, but it is grace that picks you up, grace that keeps you up, and when Jesus comes back, grace will take you up so that you can spend eternity with God. Grace calls, grace keeps, grace forgives, grace cleanses, grace strengthens, grace sees Christ live his life in you. Grace prepares you for translation from this world into the eternal kingdom of his dear son. Grace does it all, and when we minimize grace and accept a grace that does just a little, then we miss out on a lot that grace would do were we to allow it to do so. We read in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sins. And that, my friend, is grace. But the verse does not end there. To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of how much? All unrighteousness. And that too is grace. Can you say amen? amen. Grace will get inside you and work in you and transform you and will not leave you the same as when grace got hold of you. Now, can we see this in the Bible? Of course we can. But where might we go? In fact, I'll propose this. A case study of two individuals, both who were affected by grace. Two people, both of whom occupied very prominent positions in the history of God's people. To see the first, let's go back, back to our scripture reading. This would be 1 Samuel and chapter 13. Let's go there. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and when we get there, we'll pick it up in verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. This is Saul, King Saul. And we read this. 1 Samuel 13, 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a, a what? Read that phrase. A man, what? A man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Now, we understand something about the history of King Saul. Saul, Saul was a scallywag and a scoundrel. If I were to say, King Saul to you, what would come to mind? Can you help me? What comes to mind? The witch of Endor? I heard that. What else? Weak? What else? Oh man, I know, I'm sure you're all right, but I'm, I can't hear you. What is this? Coward. Cowardly, exactly right. What else? Disobedient. This is King Saul. Let's think about some of the things he did. King Saul. Um, Oh, I don't know hardly even where to begin. But let's, let's, let's think about King Saul being so jealous about David. If, there was, if, if the Olympics had been held when Saul was the king, what event would he have been in? He would have been in the javelin. He had lots of practice when David was around. He was, he was insanely jealous of David. The, 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 the ladies in the kingdom would sing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has what? 
ten thousands. Oh my. You know what? If you've killed thousands, I, I, I speak metaphorically now, just be happy with that. If someone comes along and kills ten thousands, well, praise the Lord for the great things they've done. I'm not advocating killing. I'm just using the, the, the Bible language. If you've done something, thank God. If somebody outdoes you, thank God anyway. Isn't that right? Just thank God. Thank God that you've done what God has called you to do. So he was insanely jealous. He was a coward. Great point. They're out there. When, when, when David comes down to end up fighting against Goliath, Saul's reclining under a tree. And Goliath is out there saying, why don't you send somebody to fight me? And Saul is back there cowering, cowering. He should have gone out. But he didn't go out. Now what else? Okay, there was a situation where uh, oh, Saul hunted David repeatedly. Just wouldn't quit. Out there hunting him. And then, and then David, you know, he steals his water bottle and his sword and cuts off the edge of his cloak. And he calls out, Saul, and waves. He says, oh, you've been more righteous than I. I'm so sorry, my son. Oh, how could I do this to you? And then he'd just be right back into it. This man just couldn't stop. And he hunted David relentlessly. And then there was this terrible episode where he had a bunch of priests killed. Doeg, the Edomite, ratted out these priests. And I believe it was 42. Now, that was really, really bad. And then, and then when uh, Samuel said, you need to go down and wipe out the Amalekites, he did, mostly. But he didn't kill Agag, the king, and they brought back a number of animals. And uh, now he did say the people brought them back to sacrifice. So, I mean, if you were ever going to cut him a little slack, you might be able to there. Now, let's think about these sins and imagine with me, if you would, a pair of scales. And let's put Saul's sins in one side of the scales. Well, because there's nothing in this side, the scales are immediately going to go down, aren't they? So we put in the, the, the jealousy and the relentless pursuit of David and the, the, what else, the cowardice and the killing of the priests, and, and he went to see the witch of Endor. We can't, we can't forget that. That was very bad. And this really was symptomatic of the fact that he had ultimately turned his back on God. God was no longer communicating with him by Urim or Thummim or anything else. So the scales are pretty heavily down here now. Heavy down. This Saul was a scoundrel. A scoundrel. And he was not a scoundrel to begin with. Remember? He had been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They said, is Saul also among the prophets? God raised him up. All of God's biddings are enablings. Saul had the opportunity. The ball was in his hand, but he dropped it. The opportunity was there, but he squandered it. God would have led him, but he wouldn't be led. Saul, the scoundrel king of Israel. So what else could God do? What could he do? Saul left God without a choice. God had to call a fellow. Uh, the Bible here describes him as a man after his own heart. That's good King David. Now we have a different animal here than King Saul the scoundrel. When we say King David, what do we think of? Come on now, what, what was it? One little stone went up in the air. He killed Goliath. The kingdom prospered under David. This was a fellow who killed a lion and a bear with his own hands. I mean to say, there was a man after God's own heart right there. And Israel went to greatness. He killed Goliath, this guy. King Saul said, why don't you put on my armor? And that's like your 10-year-old son trying to wear your pajamas. I mean, it, it didn't fit at all. And he said, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. He took a little strap of leather and five stones and... Phew, by the time he was done, he was standing on top of Goliath. Goliath had lost his head. He was holding Goliath's sword. And the Philistines scattered and were discomfited. And Israel had won a great victory. You see, that's what you need to lead a nation. Not a scoundrel like Saul, but a man after God's own heart like David. Now, last year, my son and I, we were home in New Zealand. And we had reason to be in the South Island of New Zealand, which is very, very beautiful. Um, and we were in the, essentially the foothills of the Southern Alps. It was Saturday night. It had been a beautiful Sabbath. We were standing around a campfire or a bonfire, really, not a campfire, a bonfire, with a group of men at a men's retreat. And uh, it was a beautiful night. And I looked up. And there, in that pristine part of the world, you understand, it was the dead of winter. But 
but there was not a cloud in the sky, no light pollution, no pollution pollution. Of course, this was New Zealand. And we looked up, and the stars in the sky, oh my goodness me, you've never seen anything like it. We said, wow, look at that. Now, about an hour later, when we were thoroughly cold and it was time to go back into the lodge, I looked up again. It was like, it was, uh, Steven Spielberg couldn't have done anything even remotely close to this. It was breathtakingly, jaw-droppingly beautiful. And I was reminded of what David had, had written. He wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show its handiwork. Beautiful. Evidently, David was a man who had spent a lot of time looking up. In, in Jerusalem, I expect there'd no, no pollution, and probably at the right time of night, there'd be very little ambient light, so he could see these beautiful stars in the sky. One night, David was walking along the rooftops, this man after God's own heart, and instead of looking up, saying, wow, He looked down and said, wow. Now, no sin had been committed up to that point. If your eyes happen to view something and just passes in front of your field of vision, you have not sinned. That's just just what happened. But what you do is you avert your gaze. Whoops. And there was Bathsheba bathing, and I have wondered why in the world she was bathing where someone might see her. But I th- I'm thinking this through. Certainly wherever she was, she believed she had a realistic expectation of having her privacy respected. And I doubt that she was thinking someone would be walking along the rooftops. But there was David. Why was he up there? We don't know. Was he, was he out stargazing? I, I don't know. I, it, the Bible does not say he went out on the prowl with mischief in his mind. It doesn't say that. So I'm giving good King David the benefit of the doubt because after all, he was a man after God's own heart. But he looked down and, and, and evidently couldn't look away. Now, you know, he should have just looked away and started thinking of mathematics problems and just got his mind off the whole thing and said, boy, oh boy, I'll forget all about that. And, and you know, that was unfortunate. I'll never let her know. I don't want to be embarrassed. But he didn't do that, this man after God's own heart. What he did instead was allow lust to develop to the place where it, it hatched into adultery. Adding to that deception, there was more deception so that this poor lady's husband was, was taken out into the hottest part of the battle and abandoned there so that he would certainly die, and he did. Man after God's own heart. And David, uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of this illicit tryst, fathered a child who lived for about a week and died. Let's think about these scales again, because I'd like to do something with you. Let's start putting good King David's sins in the other side of the scales. And so we'll put in a little lust, and then some adultery, and cold-blooded murder, and deception, and home wrecking, and let's put in the scales too the fact that he was responsible for the death of that innocent child. Now, I don't know how much we've got to put in here before we we lift this, because Saul, he had a kind of a lot of sins in that scale. But let's see what we can add. Let's see what we can add to that. Um, What was the name of David's wife, anyway? What was her name? Yeah. See, um, some people collect stamps, other sports cars, some souvenir teaspoons, David, wives. Don't excuse it as being cultural. Cultural, cultural, cultural. It was still wrong. I mean, cultural is fine when it's in harmony with the law of God. But when culture and the Bible don't agree, We stand on the Bible. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. Uh, Oh, I I guess I should keep these in order, but I'm I'm in a certain track here that I really must get out of quite quickly. But David was old and sick and cold. Now, 
where I grew up, and I grew up in an old house that was not insulated, and it, it got wickedly cold in the wintertime. Not, not Michigan cold, but, but cold nonetheless. And uh, we had hot water bottles. Did you ever have a hot water bottle? Yeah, they're great things, aren't they? You put hot water in it, you put them down the bottom, you get in bed, your feet can be warm, bring it on up here. Mm. <laughs> Evidently, they didn't have hot water bottles in David's day. Because when David was old and sick and cold, they brought a woman to get in his bed with him. David will warm you up this way. Now, I'm not suggesting that any monkey business took place. Evidently, David was took near the very end of his life anyway. But that, that just doesn't look good no matter how you cut it. In the Bradshaw family, we were so inspired by that that the last time I had the flu, my wife said, no, no, forget the chicken soup. She said to my daughter, honey, run next door and get the neighbor's wife. Bring her over. <laughs> no way. I mean, what in the world? But for the king, for the king, I, 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 no, let's just put that in the scale, all right? That was wrong. Now, we're just, getting, we're just getting started with David. David was a terrible father. He obviously wasn't in the mix with his children very often. He had this terrible, terrible situation, this, this terrible, immoral situation that took place in his family. Absalom was so mad with Amnon that he, was, that he started plotting his death immediately. Absalom therefore became estranged from his father. David had to be encouraged to go and try and make the peace with Absalom. The kingdom was, was giving away beneath David's feet. David simply should have gone to his son and said, Son, let's take a weekend and go fishing together. What do you say? But he couldn't do it. He was a useless father. I don't think that God wrote in the books of heaven, David, great father, very happy with his parenting skills. I don't think that would be put in the plus column. But it was a liability for David. And he knew better and he should have done better, but he wouldn't because he was stubborn and egotistical. He allowed the kingdom to split. He could have and should have saved it all if he'd just gone to Absalom, sat down, and said, all right, boy, let's work this out together. Couldn't. Man after God's own heart. I'm putting that in the scale as well. David saved the best to last. He said to his right hand, man, I want you to go and number the kingdom. Oh, no, your majesty, not a good idea. David said, who's the king around here? You'll do what you're told. And so off they went. And that's when God came to David and said, shouldn't have done that. I'll give you three options. You can pick one, one of the three. And David said, always better to fall into the hands of a merciful God. By the time it was over, 70,000 people had died. 70,000 people had died. God killed them. Now, these weren't the scum of society. They weren't the, the people in maximum security who'd been put there for bad crimes that they had committed. This one, the off-scouring of Israel. These were everyday people, 70 thousands of them, who died because of what David did in direct violation of the Word of God. You know something? I'm looking at these scales right now, and boom! Saul is starting to look like a choir boy by comparison. David, a man after God's own heart. Now, I know what you've already been thinking, but John... God didn't mean that David was a man after God's own heart while he was collecting wives and while he was allowing the kingdom to turn to custard and while he was numbering Israel and causing 70,000 innocent people to die. No, you can't say that he was a man after God's own heart then. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. But I'd like to look with you in Acts chapter 13. Let's go there together. Acts chapter 13. It's fascinating what Paul said about David looking back. In Acts chapter 13, you get down to about verse, oh, about verse 22, I think it is. We'll find out when we get there. It is verse 22, but we'll go to verse 21 first. I find this really interesting. Paul was preaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Luke wrote this down. Now, you know that there was a lot Paul said that Luke didn't write down. The book of Acts is only 28 uh, uh, chapters long, after all. So, so Luke chose to include in his letter to Theophilus, evidently the things that were germane, very important. Paul is looking back over the history of Israel. 
he says this in verse 21 and on. And afterward, he, he said, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, that's really interesting. I, I know what he's doing here. He's quoting from 1 Samuel. That's fine. But in Acts 2, you've got Peter saying, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, who is both dead and buried, and a sepulcher is with us to this day. He spoke about David as being a hero of the nation of Israel. Jesus, after all, was known as the son of God. David, uh, this man, David, was referred to later in the book of Acts as a man after God's own heart. You don't read in the book of Acts that David was a reformed adulterer. You don't read there where they said when they were preaching, David the murderer, David the cheat, David the homewrecker, David the deceiver. David, the number of Israel and the killer of 70,000 innocents. You don't read that. Now, how can that possibly be? David was dysfunctional. David, look, if you take it in totality, the brother was a train wreck. If it was you, 70,000 dead, whole bunch of spouses, ruined your home, you know, I don't know that we'd nominate you to be the head elder or the chairman of the church board or anything else. We'd probably say, oh, great potential, but keeps on sticking his foot in it or her foot in it, however it might be. So we have a, what I would call a conundrum here. We have a conundrum. You've got Saul, certainly a bad fellow, certainly somebody who allowed certain things to get in the way of his relationship with God, and we remember him negatively. He ended up taking his own life out on the barren hills of Gilboa. That was Saul. But David, who, who looked like he was playing poker with Saul, and he said, I will see your wickedness, and I will raise it, raise it to a new level. What gives here that Saul died in ignominy? He lived in, he is remembered with, in infamy. But David, who sinned in a thousand different ways, and cost all kinds of lives, and jeopardized the kingdom, and therefore the line through which Messiah would come. This man we remember for his good deeds. How's that? I would submit to you tonight that the answer is written on my birth certificate. John, God is gracious. Well, wait a minute. Was God not gracious to King Saul? Of course he was. He pled with Saul. He went after Saul. God pursued Saul. God gave Saul opportunity after opportunity to repent. God spoke to the heart of King Saul. God, uh, uh, what did God say to Hosea of Israel? I will speak comfortably to her and allure her. That's how God deals with the erring. And undoubtedly God dealt with King Saul that way. But King Saul hardened his heart, would not yield, did not come to God. Now let's look at what David did. I need you to turn with me in your Bible to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. How did David respond to God? David fell into sin. Well, actually, it seemed more like occasionally David fell into obedience. But here was David in the Psalms, in Psalm 51. This is David's beautiful psalm, and it is known as a psalm of repentance. Here's what David said. This is Psalm 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out, what does it say next? Blot out what? Whose transgressions? If you've done prison ministry, what you'll know is that frequently you'll come across people in prison who will say, I never did it. I was framed. It was a setup. I'm innocent. Not all of them. Of course not. I don't mean that. But there are those you'll meet in prison who will deny that they were convicted justly. Certainly some of them may have been convicted unjustly. But David didn't play that game, not with God. Verse 2, wash me 
thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I made a visit to a penitentiary while I was a church pastor. And I was visiting there a man on death row. He's still on death row. He has been sentenced to die for his crimes, his not inconsiderable crimes. Now let me ask you a question. If you're on death row and you've been convicted justly, have you done bad things, yes or no? Oh yes, very bad things. But can God save somebody on death row, yes or no? Under what circumstances can God save somebody on death row? Now God better be able to save somebody on death row because we've all been on death row. The wages of sin is death row. That's exactly right. And I spoke to this man through the little, through a speaker, but he had a, a, a window in his cell door. I don't know, was it this long? Very narrow. I looked into a cell. You can say what you want about people having it easy in prison, but you do not want to switch places. And I looked at his teeny tiny cell. It was just the size of a closet, and my heart just about, it just about died within me. Oh no, I saw this man living in this place for decades and wondering what it must be doing to him psychologically, even spiritually. He said to me, I feel terrible with tears streaming down his face. Streaming. I feel terrible for my crimes which I have committed. While he was in there, he was converted. He came to faith in God and he was baptized in that prison and he is a member of your church. Praise the Lord. You know, a church isn't a good church unless there's a few murderers in it. I mean it. If your church doesn't have someone who turns up every now and then smelling of liquor or cigarette smoke, then you're not doing your job. Plain and simple. Not doing your job. God, God didn't tell us that, that the churches are to be museums of the holy and the faithful and the ready for translation. If we're witnessing and sharing our faith, there'll be some stragglers coming there. There'll be some people who you look at and go, Whoa, did you get lost on your way to the bar today? There'll be some folks like that because God welcomes them all. And when God is using us, we will bring them to the foot of the cross. Is that not right? That's right. And this man said, I feel terrible for my sins, which I have committed. He wrote to me and he said, please pray for me. But more importantly, pray for the families of my victims. That's an attitude God can do something with. God can save a man like that. He has saved that man. That man might be behind bars, but he is free because if the Son of God shall make you free, you will be what? Free indeed, and he is free indeed. David was free indeed. This was a man who had trouble keeping his nose clean. But I tell you what he did every time he got down, he looked up and he called out to God. And he said to God in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be wiser than snow. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David prayed from the depths, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. And David understood something many of us don't. He knew what he would do with salvation if God gave it to him. Save me, God, from sin. But for what? For what? He understood it in verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. This is perhaps another subject, but let's add it in here. David knew that he would be saved, but saved so that God could use him to go and save somebody else. And this is what set David apart. David was not a good man. It is arguable that David was a good king. I would say no. He had his good points. Israel certainly prospered under him. No doubt about it. But this was a man stained with immorality. Blood on his hands. Jeopardized the kingdom. Don't forget those 70 thousands of people who died because of David. And what we learn tonight is that the grace of God is able to save and turn around and change 
and transform even a David so that he, once a man after God's own heart, can be a man after God's own heart again. How is it with you tonight? How is it with you? You know, some of us aren't very sure how to relate to the gift of salvation. Uh, if I were to say to you, are you a man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart? You'd likely say, well, <laughs> well I don't know, you know, I don't know. I hope so. I'm trying to be. Maybe one day, God willing. Come on now. You shouldn't have any doubt about that. I'm not asking you about your performance. I'm asking you about your standing with God. I know about your performance. You are a sinner. Simple as that. We all are. We know that about each other. Can you say you're a man after God's own heart? A woman after God's own heart? You ought to be able to. I don't mean boastingly. I mean confidently. You need to be able to say, I am in a saving relationship with Jesus. A saving relationship with Jesus. You ought to be able to say that with confidence, with certainty. I may have already told you before about a, a lady I met coming out of early service in our church once. I shook her hand, and I don't know what we were saying, but I said, and you know the good news is, Jesus is coming back soon. And she dared to say to me, and pastor, I hope I'm ready. I gave her the look. I said to the next person in line, hold on, we'll be back. And I ushered her over here, just over to the side of the foyer. And she said, pastor, am I in trouble? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, you really are. I said, what was that you said to me back then about the second coming of Jesus? She said, well, I, 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 I hope I'm ready. And I said, no, no, no. I don't want you to hope you're ready. You shouldn't hope that you're going to be ready when Jesus comes. And she looked at me with a little confusion in her eye, and I said to her, Sister, you should know that you're going to be ready when Jesus comes back. This was just a new idea to her. I said, are you living in sin? No. Boyfriends? No, pastor. Drug habit? Still drinking? Pastor. Have you given your heart to Jesus? Yes. Did he ever give it back? No. <laughs> then when Jesus comes back, can we confidently say you're going to go up with him? Well, I suppose so. And I said, I suppose so too. So let's not be hoping you're going to be ready. Let's be believing that you're going to be ready when Jesus comes back. And she smiled. That'll make you smile. We can have confidence now. We can have confidence that God has made us men and women after his own heart. I'm not talking about presumption. I don't mean that. I don't mean that because that's not grace. That's cheap grace. Cheap grace says I'm practicing sin and living how I like and I'm ignoring the word of God and that's okay. God will save me because of grace. Cheap grace. Those are the ones who will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we? And Jesus says, I never knew you. But we can afford to say tonight, I have given my heart to Jesus. I'm hanging on by faith. I'm growing daily. When I fall, I fall in the direction of the city of refuge. And Jesus, Jesus lifts me up. I've read the verse, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, because the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Come on now, somebody say amen. This is good news tonight. This is what grace can do. And it can do it in a moment now. You can choose Christ and then say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my hope. Jesus is my righteousness. And he has given me his righteousness, not to cover up my sin so that I'm still hanging on to it, but to take it away and make me what I could never make myself. This is the work of grace, the work that God, a gracious God, will do in your heart if, like David, you are willing. If you're willing. That's all. You know, if we have to wait until we're strong before we can have the certainty of salvation, we're going to be waiting for a little while. Waiting for a little while. But I've read it, I expect you have too, that Jesus himself said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. There you go. There you go. God does not ask you if you're strong. He asks you if you're weak. 
And when you're honest and you say, yes, I am, then God says, all right now, let your weakness and my strength meet together at the cross. Now hang on to me and trust in me. What did the writer to the Hebrews say? Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this, friend, is a time of need. And David found grace. Saul was offered grace. He just rejected grace. He was stubborn. Both men were sinful men. Both men were sinners. Both men did terrible things. But one man refused to let go of the hope that he had in Jesus Christ. And he hung on. Uh, In David's case, hope in the Messiah who was to come. So I ask you again, how is it with you tonight? If things are good between you and God, then I say praise the Lord. Long may that continue. There's no reason it shouldn't. But if things are not, you know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that by and large, God's people understand the what. We understand that. If you love me, we know that. But I'm thinking that the trouble is many of us don't know the how. And therefore, we're not confident. And we read stories about David, the man after God's own heart. We don't hardly even know what to make of those stories. Maybe tonight you walked in carrying a load of sin. You can walk out without it tonight. You can walk out without it. Jesus came into the world to die for your sins. You can walk out without it. I don't mean walk out with it and say, grace means that I'm still going on to glory. I don't mean that. Walk out without it. And we'll talk more about this as the week progresses. We can't cover everything in one short time. But you can walk out without your sin. No condemnation. No fear. No worry. No misgivings. None of that. But confidence. Because we have come to the throne of grace And we have found mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. How is it with your heart tonight? There's no reason why you cannot say, it is well with my soul. There was David drowning in sin. But he never let go of God. To the point where he would not turn back to God. He never turned his back on God like Saul and said, I'm done with him. I will not accept his goodness. This David was a repentant man. I have sinned. Are you able to say that to God? I've done wrong. I sinned. It is my doing. If you can then God can help you, and he will. And like David, history will demonstrate that you, in spite of your misdeeds, were declared by God to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. Because we deserve it? No. Because we earned it? No. Because we curried favor in the sight of God. No. Why? Because of what's written on my birth certificate. God is gracious. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you tonight that there is hope for us, even us. Now, too many of us in this place struggling. It's up and down. And we want the roller coaster to stop. Instead, we want to be on the up and up, growing in Jesus, living our life connected to Him. I thank you tonight that your word encourages us. Saul will be raised in the second resurrection through no fault of yours, Lord, 
but simply because when grace was offered to him, he rejected it. David, on the other hand, no better a man, no better a track record than Saul. When he got down into sin, looked up, and he saw the face of a gracious God offering him pardon and justification and forgiveness and restoration. We are encouraged tonight. There is a lot of David in all of us. But tonight we are glad. In spite of ourselves, still you say to us, be zealous therefore and repent. In spite of ourselves, still you say to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In spite of ourselves, you remind us that Jesus came into this world to save us from our sins. Lord, we ask you to do that even right now. We turn to you. We claim your forgiveness and your grace. And we praise you that in your sight, by your grace, we can be men and women after your own heart. Let that be now and always. We pray together in Jesus' name. Please say.